<laughs> Hello, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, on behalf of the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, it's my special pleasure to welcome you here tonight. My name is Martin Klimke. I'm the Associate Dean for Humanities here at NYU uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, we're especially delighted uh, to welcome tonight Professor Melissa Nobles from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Professor Nobles, whom we have the pleasure um, to see, of seeing here at NYU Abu Dhabi for the very first time, is the Kenan Sahin Dean of the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at MIT, where she's also a professor of political science. Uh, she's a graduate of Brown University, where she majored in history, and she received her MA and PhD in political science from Yale University. She has held fellowships at Boston University's Institute for Race and Social Division and Harvard University's Radcliffe Center for Advanced Studies. Professor Nobles has also served on the editorial boards of Polity, American Political Science Review, and currently serves on the editorial uh, board of Perspectives on Politics. Um, she has also been involved in faculty governance at MIT and beyond, serving previously as the associate chair of the MIT faculty from 2007 to 2009 and the vice president of the American Political Science Association. Broadly speaking, her research uh, focuses on the historical institutional origins of identity with a special emphasis on racial and color identifications, on transnational, transitional justice, coercion, as well as subnational authoritarianism. And what I found particularly um, impressive is the geographical reach of her studies, which includes countries in North and South America, as well as East Asia. Professor Nobles is also the author of the landmark study, Shades of Citizenship, Race and the Census in Modern Politics, published in 2000 by Stanford University Press, which won the W.E.B. Du Bois Outstanding Book Award, and which several of us uh, among the faculty have used and are using uh, in our courses. She's also the author of The Politics of Official Apologies, published by Cambridge University Press in 2008, and uh, the co-editor of Inherited Responsibility and Historical Reconciliation in East Asia, published in 2013. Her current research is focused on constructing a database of racial murders in the American South from 1930 to 1954. Working closely as a faculty collaborator and advisory board member of Northeastern Law School's Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Law Clinic, she has conducted extensive archival research unearthing understudied and more often unknown racial murders and contributing to several legal investigations. And tonight, she's going to give us an insight in this sadly very timely research with a talk entitled Behind the Lynchings, Uncovering Racial Violence in the U.S. South, from 1930 to 1954. Professor Nobles, thank you very much for coming and welcome to NYU Abu Dhabi. Thank you, Martin, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is my first time at NYU Abu Dhabi. In fact, it's my first time in, the UI, in, in Abu Dhabi, so I'm happy to be here uh, and surviving a long plane trip, but I'm here. So as Martin mentioned, I'm going to talk tonight about my project of Behind the Lynchings Uncovering Racial Violence in the American South. Let me say a bit about that, and then I'm going to show a video that better explains the project. Then I'll come back and, and contextualize what we've seen in the film um, uh, to research about violence in the South. So racial violence, uh, in many ways, has reemerged as per perpetrated either by law enforcement, policemen, or by private citizens, has reemerged as a really big issue in the United States right now. But racially motivated violence is deeply rooted in American history, and and uh, and part of what my my research and my collaborators' research is dedicated to is better understanding the nature of that violence. So back in 20, 10 years ago now, uh, 207. Margaret Burnham and I, who I'll be showing in a minute on the film, um, launched a, a conference at Northeastern University School of Law. Northeastern University School of Law is in Boston, Massachusetts. And it was a, a, a conference that we thought was going to be about the nature of violence during the civil rights movement. So from after the issues of integration of American schools in 1954 up through the 1960s, the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1964, the Civil Rights Act in 1965, and all that we know is associated with the Civil Rights Movement, 
Um, we thought, well, let's have a better idea of, of the murders that were conducted in the process of that movement and what happened to the perpetrators and to the victims. So surely we thought there's some kind of database that exists. And to our surprise, for all of the ways in which there's been ton, a ton of literature about the civil rights movement, there is virtually very little, with the exception of huge cases of murder, where we have a sense of the scope of the violence. Although, if you look at, um, any of you who are familiar with the civil rights movement knows that there was a tremendous backlash against it um, by many uh, Southerners, white Southerners. But sadly, there is not really at least a reliable so sense of the scope and nature of that violence. But as bad as our understanding of civil rights during the civil rights, violence during the civil rights movement, there's even less known about the period before the civil rights movement. So from 19, so we decided we'd look at from 1930 to 1954. We started 1930 because there's been some scholarship that has looked at the question of lynchings. And here, just by way of definition, a lynching is, is a term of art. It's not a legal term but it's the term that basically stands for extra legal violence. That is violence that is done outside of due process. It's commonly known sometimes as vigilante violence, um, which doesn't accurately capture it because in certain cases, the perpetrators were the police themselves, what would be known as custodial deaths. That is, persons who were taken into police custody and before they get to the jail are dead. Right? So though that is also against the law. So you have police officers who in certain instances were per perpetrating violence and then private citizens. Um, so we wanted to better understand, so a study has been done which stops at 1930. Um, but we decided we wanted to look from 1930 to 1954, stopping at 1954, um, mostly because it's, it's the Brown, connected to the Brown versus Board of Education decision, which led to the desegregation of American schools. But 1954 onward, one could hypothesize or reasonably uh, argue that violence at that point was directed at the civil rights movement itself, at the mobilization uh, of, uh, for civil rights. But so if the period from 1930 to 1954 is right in the heart of what is described in American history as the Jim Crow period, meaning the, the period of legal segregation in the American South. And when I say the American South, I mean the 11 states that made up the Confederacy those are the states that succeeded from the Union during the Civil War. The reason for the Civil War was succession, state rights, states' rights. The states wanted to maintain slavery. The Union did not. So we look at the 11 southern states. Since after the Civil War, through construction, I'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, they were the states where you had the, the, uh, the institution of de facto, de facto and de jure, by law, segregation. So we thought we would look there and see what happened? What do we know about these murders? As it turns out, there's virtually nothing that has been done, hence the creation of this database. Professor Burnham and I have a pretty unique relationship. Uh, I'm the political scientist, she's the lawyer, but she's got the labor, that is the students. And the students play an important part of the story as you will soon see in our video. In part because the students help us to investigate these cases. We typically start out with something very basic, a newspaper article. Why newspapers? You can't really rely on local police to have these data. There was no interest in southern states in keeping accurate data, so you can't go to the police department and say how many black people were murdered. Right? You can't necessarily go to um, civil, civil records. Those records aren't going to be um, easily available, nor are court records without some kind of, of, uh, of uh, reason for wanting, for wanting that information. So we start out with a newspaper article and we tell the students the first thing that you need to do is find out something about this victim. The first thing you have to figure out, was there actually a death? So the student goes and they find the death certificate. Then after that, they try to find the next of kin, who is the person that's closest to the victim. And it's usually grandchildren, sometimes great-grandchildren we are able to locate. Once the student locates the family member, that family member comes to, becomes the student's client. And from then on, the student is representing the family. And they then begin to do further discovery, documentary discovery, which basically means submitting what are known as FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Acts from the United States government to either the Department of Justice or the FBI, because sometimes these cases were investigated, sometimes not. They would go down to local 
counties in different southern states, go into the courthouses, go into musty rooms. This isn't, these are not fancy places. There's no, there's no digital, digital file keeping. It's basically going through books and going through papers and figuring out if they can find out these, this information. So it's quite time intensive. And from those efforts, we in turn are beginning to compile this database. So I'm gonna stop now and show you, this is a 15 minute clip and it explains, it looks at three cases. It explains our methods. Then on the other side, I'll talk a bit about the scholarly context in which to put this and, uh, and, and some of the things that we're finding and then open it up for questions. And I'm always happy to also, I think the, the, the video will give us a lot to talk about um, doing questions and answers. We can get the video, please. The word had come through that there was a possibility of a drive-by. I remember her screaming and saying, don't hurt him. I remember that. The doctor, as well as the chef, were all in this together, and they, they worked very hard to cover it up. In the years leading up to the Civil Rights era, when segregation was the social order of the South, acts of racial violence were widespread, including murder. Law enforcement turned a blind eye, and the courts usually did nothing. Killers went free, while the victims' families had little choice but to suffer their pain in silence. At Northeastern University School of Law, the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project seeks to keep these crimes from fading into history. The project examines how the legal system failed the victims of racial violence then and pursues remedies now, decades after the crimes were committed. The Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Clinic operates like a law firm. Our cases are cold cases. We work to develop the cases and to obtain some measure of justice for those communities that were affected. We're now working with a period of uh, American history that has really not been adequately explored. The persons who have knowledge about these events, the family members, the witnesses, are aging. The documents are disappearing. And if we don't do this now, this piece of our history will be lost to us and to future generations. In April 1953, in Wilcox County, Alabama, Sheriff Lummy Jenkins and two deputies invaded the cafe operated by 63-year-old Della McDuffie and her husband, William. The lawmen claimed they were playing music after midnight on the Sabbath. Although Della McDuffie was paralyzed and in a wheelchair, Sheriff Jenkins beat her with a rubber hose, and within an hour, she was dead. So he walked in and hit her, told her, get up, old lady, and go to bed. So she told him she couldn't get up. So he hit her across her arm on her knees. Then he hit her in the head. And he shot down by her feet a couple of times. That was it. I went down to Alabama to conduct some research on the Della McDuffie case. I dug up the file from Thurgood Marshall to the current head of the Department of Justice asking for him to look into the McDuffie case. But at the time of Della McDuffie's murder, Marshall was working on the case of Brown versus the Board of Education, which the Supreme Court decided in 1954. The McDuffie case did not get enough attention from the NAACP, and the Justice Department refused to prosecute the sheriff. So I retrieved the FBI file related to the case from the National Archives. I received the citation for it 
I saw a lot of affidavits with witness testimony, including people who were in the cafe that evening, the undertaker, the doctor, Sheriff Lemmy Jenkins, and Ella McDuffie's husband and son. William McDuffie gave a statement to the FBI. I could see him striking at one person, then another with the hose lag weapon. I saw a number hit with the weapon in Sheriff Jenkins' hand. But Dr. Robert E. Dixon's statement reads, I can definitely state that the cause of death was not brought on by any injury to the head, such as a blow. This case essentially was a cover-up, and it never went to court. A year into the investigation, her husband, William, was found dead by his two grandchildren. I found my grandfather, and it appeared that he had been killed by, by way of drowning. They killed him because of the intensity of this investigation. They tried to get him to change his mind and change his statements like everyone else did. He refused to do that. Uh, and they took care of it. There was house fires. Our house was burned down two times. There had been other threats. This man came to the door and he said, you need to get your family and leave here. He said, they are going to kill you. And we left in the middle of the night. They left the house completely furnished, cars, everything was intact. We left just like that. For 32 years, Wilcox County, which was largely black, was Sheriff Lummy Jenkins' personal empire. He gained notoriety for playing by his own rules, legal or not. Lummy Jenkins was known for the way he he enforced law here in Wilcox County. And, uh, and he did it with an iron hand. They followed their own route, not so much what the law said. Uh, it was tough on, on certain people, especially black folks. Lummy was a good sheriff, but uh, somebody else may have a different opinion. The McDuffie story is, in fact, it's a story of violence, it's a story of secrecy, uh, it's a story of banishment. This repeated silencing is a large part of, of what we try to address in our project. My father was Malcolm Wright, and he was a sharecropper. In July 1949, in Chickasaw County, Mississippi, Malcolm Wright, his wife, and children were riding in a mule-drawn wagon heading into town on a Saturday morning when three men in the car yelled that he should stop hogging the road. And we were just riding along, doing our normal, singing our songs. And um, I remember a black car approached us, and they turned around and came back. And then they took a object from the trunk of the car. As a child, I thought it was a, a crowbar. It's on, it's on Saturday. This is where Malcolm died at, where they pulled over the wagon, right here. It's day like today. They had to hit him in the head with a with a with a car jack, so they told me. And they beat his brains out there in the road. So at the beginning I just had a, a article that just mentioned that Malcolm Wright was killed in Houston, Mississippi. I researched online and found various news articles from the 1940s, 1950s. The Historical Genealogical Society, they also had various articles on Malcolm Wright. 
In the Malcolm Wright case, our student found every single one of the living sons and daughters of Malcolm Wright, brought this story back to them. No one had ever talked to the Wright children about what happened to them. James Moore went on trial for his life in the Bumperjack murder of Malcolm Wright. Named in the original indictment were James Red Kellum and Eunice Gore. My older sister and Henry, they allowed them and my mom to testify, but they didn't allow the three younger children to testify. When Henry got ready to testify, the judge told him, you make sure you tell the truth. And, and you refer to me as Mr. The all-white jury found James Moore not guilty. Kellum and Gore were never tried. All three walked away free, and the Wright family had to move out of Mississippi. This is a case in which you have the appearance, but not the reality, of any real justice. We've tried again in this case to get the county to acknowledge that something went wrong here and that it's the duty and the responsibility of the county to make it right. And we've been told, no, that can't happen because uh, the perpetrators still live and work in this town. The, the brother of the perpetrator became the mayor of the town and was the mayor for many years. My statement is, if we've already closed it, you start the healing process, a wound. You've got another wound that you're wanting to reopen. Reopening a wound, it takes longer to heal. And that's kind of, that's the way I look at it. We was all in, having fun, playing music. And this particular record came on. And my cousin said, do you want to dance? We heard a loud, loud noise. All of a sudden, he turned my hand loose and fell to the floor. And I heard people saying, you just killed that boy. And I looked down on the floor, and he was laying down there. October 1955, Mayflower, Texas. Two men, Perry Dean Ross and Joe Simpson, went on a drive-by shooting rampage through the black part of town and fired nine shots into a cafe. Came on down the road and shot in the school bus. My dad drove in the car, our car, and came on up May Mayflower, you know, shooting. I was hit in the cafe by a bullet, and my sister was too. From what I heard, there was anger from the white community uh, considering uh, schools being built for uh, black kids. I was a law student at Northeastern University School of Law when I started investigating the John Earl Reese case. I got a first-hand look at how deeply this impacted a community and how deeply this incident impacted people. And they were not just impacted by the murder and the shooting of the street and the shooting up of the school, but they were also deeply impacted by the way that that history was erased. I went to the Gregg County Courthouse and looked through records. I found John Earl Reese's death certificate, which indicated that he died from an accident. I spent time figuring out how to get that death certificate changed and making sure that it actually got changed. And I found that Ross, one of the perpetrators, was convicted of murder, but then did not serve any time. He was given a five-year suspended sentence, but not a day in jail. What's particularly remarkable was the platform for restorative justice that Kaylee, working along with that community, was able to build. I helped the community to raise money to obtain a civil rights marker. We also had a street sign named John Earl Reese Road, which is actually on the street where he grew up. 
My research was collected and put in a binder in the Tatum Library so that younger generations could come to the library and learn about the history of John Earl Reese. Finally, Kaylee Simon helped to plan an all-day event to celebrate the life of John Earl Reese. Hundreds of family and friends attended. The gravestone was unveiled. The civil rights marker was revealed. The street sign dedicated. A painting commemorating John Earl Reese was presented. And at the Tatum Library, a plaque dedicated. Speeches were made. And finally, everyone sat down for a meal together at the community church. And we were so proud to participate in the John Earl Reese Memorial. It was a wonderful event, well attended, and everyone there walked away with a, a blessing in their heart. After so many, many years, even as time went by and everything, that soon it was time for justice. Something happened in this community, and it was important enough that we came together and there is a marker. And then just across the road there is John Earl's Lane. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The CRRJ Clinic is really at the heart of Northeastern's unique approach to legal education, which is that students learn not only from books, but they learn by doing. I feel so lucky as a law student to have come down here and to be welcomed by this community. And I wanna make it my life's work to make sure that this is never forgotten. this down guys you going to put the other thing down so that's our project that's kind of what we do um, so I thought I'd take some time to say a bit about where this fits within how scholars are thinking about the period and uh, and say a bit about how s s violence has been studied and then open it up for questions so in a way, when thinking about looking at this, it would seem that um, that the U.S. would be an, uh, would be an interesting place to think about these issues. So this is why, as, as I'm a comparativist, I study comparative politics, and so the issue of democratization—that is, how a country's political institutions and its social norms becomes democratic—has been a central concern of political scientists. It is an important question that has emerged quite forcefully in our time with the end of military dictatorships in Latin America, with the fall of the Soviet Union and the ending of apartheid in South Africa, with the reunification of Germany, and with the ending of military, certain military regimes in many African countries. But the discussion of democratization would seemingly be one in which the U.S. Uh, would, be, would not be included. You don't think about it. After all, the U.S. is viewed as the world's exemplar of democracy with three independent yet connected branches of government anchored in the U.S. Constitution, the rule of law. That is certainly true, but as this video shows, that is not the whole story. The U.S. and certain regions within the U.S. have gone through a period of democratization in the mid-20th century, what we now call the Civil Rights Movement. But my research, as, you, as, as we know, focuses on the period before that, what some scholars have described as authoritarian in the American South before democratization. So I'm describing the American South as an authoritarian regime existing within a larger democracy. So after, we, as you all may know, after the Civil War, which ended in 1865, and between that period and 1900, Southern state legislat leg legislatures basically actively tried to dis actively disenfranchise uh, African American citizens um, and this disenfranchisement basically took away the, the right to vote. Now, you may know that after the, Civil War, after the Civil War, there were three amendments which were passed, the 13th Amendment which ended slavery, the 14th Amendment, which is uh, equal protection as well as constituting citizenship at the national level. 
and the 15th Amendment, which gave men the right to vote. Women did not get the right to vote in, in the U.S. until 1920 with the 19th Amendment. But state Southern legislatures developed procedures, and the whole and the sole really purpose of these procedures was to disenfranchise the voters. And so common tactics included, for example, asking certain citizens to pay a poll tax, which also had the, the, uh, uh, the consequence of, of disenfranchising many poor white farmers. And sometimes it had uh, uh, citizens uh, 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 pass a literacy test, which sometimes meant in, in interpreting long legal passages, oftentimes tests that the examiners themselves could not pass. So in effect, um, Authoritarian rule, as at least as it pertained to African Americans, was achieved through legal means. It was made competitive, so in that regard, by having it such that you you had the Fifteenth Amendment, but you made it impossible for people to vote. So you have you, you have a democracy, but not really, right? It was a way that authoritarian rule in the Southern states was able and was kept compatible with national uh, democratic governance at the national level. So if one lived, for example, in one part of the country, you lived in the democracy. And if you lived in South Carolina, where my mother was raised, you lived on authoritarianism. So this difference, authoritarianism at a regional level, but democratic at a national level, has also been the historical experience of several Latin American countries, namely Mexico and Argentina. And indeed, political scientists who study the Americas look at Mexico and Argentina and the American South as examples of authoritarian regimes existing within nominally democratic states. So that's what interests me about this as a political scientist and as a comparativist, not only looking at the American South um, in its own right, but also comparing it to other uh, 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 government arrangements where you can have non-democracies existing within nominal democracies at the federal level. So with that, let me, I want to say a bit more just about what it means uh, to think about authoritarian, authoritarianism, because in one way, much of a political science tends to focus on that people can't vote. But my interest is less that, and it's more as important as that is. Uh, um, and one of the reasons why voting is obviously so important is because if people can vote, then they can hold their governments accountable. And so by not allowing black citizens to vote, they were unable to, to hold their governors and mayors accountable. But another important part of, of, of what made this um, authoritarian was also the, uh, the norms of Jim Crow, meaning the ways in which blacks and whites were able to interact or not with each other. Segregation, which extended not only to public schools, but to hospitals, lunch counters, cemeteries, churches, any public space was segregated. And that was throughout the southern states. Uh, and finally, uh, what I think has been most important and most understudied, if not most important, which is the use of violence. So I, I, I explained at the beginning why we started with 1930, but I did mention that there was a book that came before and a database that was developed uh, by two sociologists. Um, it's, it's a book called the Pest A Festival of Violence and Analysis of Southern Lynchings. Um, from 1882 to 1930, and they, and they look as we do. They start with, with newspaper accounts and then try to find other corroborating evidence to show that these deaths did happen. So according to them, between 1882 and 1930, they, they identify approximately um, 2,800 victims located in 10 southern states. Of this number, nearly, uh, five, uh, nearly 2,500 were African Americans. Um, 300 were white men and white women. And of the black victims, 94% were murdered by what would then call large lynch mobs. Uh, so their focus tends to be on mob violence as opposed to riots. Um, and they aren't necessarily interested in murders committed by one or two persons. But as I mentioned earlier, the issue of lynching, is, though not a term of art, is one that scholars have struggled to deal with. How do we actually think about a lynching? And in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, the NAACP and the Tuskegee Institute, which is an all-black uh, university in Alabama, were both competing to count the number of, of uh, lynchings. And they were fighting over the definition. The main point of contention between the two was that the NAACP wanted to include police officers and the Tuskegee Institute did not. 
Tuskegee did not want to include police officers because they were trying to get the police on the side of black Americans. And they felt that by saying that they were perpetrators, they would make it politically impossible for them to get white support to stop um, lynchings. The NAACP had fought from 1930, from 1900 to 1930, well, based, from 1910 rather, to 1930 to pass federal anti-lynching legislation. They were never successful. Southern senators would constantly filibuster, meaning they would get on the floor of the US Senate and make it impossible to have a vote. So there was never any anti-lynching legislation passed. They were quite successful. Filibustering was quite successfully used by uh, Southerners. It was again used in 1965 to stop passage of the Civil Rights Act. They filibustered the Civil Rights Act for 57 days, but eventually it was passed. That was because it was passed in, 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 in 65 in large part because of now we had the civil rights movement and mass mobilization. But the period that I'm describing, the NAACP had nowhere level, level that level of support from, there was not yet a civil rights movement, black Americans were not yet mobilized in that way, and there was insufficient support from the rest of the country to um, allow for the passage of anti-lynching legislation. So when the NAACP and the Tuskegee Institute got together, they had to decide, how are we going to think about lynchings? How are we going to describe these murders? What makes them different than just someone going up and killing someone, right? So they had to come up with a definition, and it had four elements. The first was that evidence that a person has been killed, right? So it couldn't be rumors of people missing, because that was also pretty, pretty common in the South. People would disappear. Um, and, um, and sometimes they were killed and sometimes they were not. They had fled. So they had to have actual evidence. As you know from our project, we make sure that there's a death certificate. It's one of the first places that the students look. The sec second was that the person must have met their death illegally. And here was the bone of contention between the Tuskegee Institute and the NAACP. The NAACP thought that it should be expansive enough to include police. Tuskegee thought not. A group of three or more persons must have participated in the killing, so they weren't interested necessarily in mob violence and such. And most importantly, the group must have acted under the pretext of service to justice, tradition, or race. So those are the definitions, and Professor Berner and I, and I have largely gone along with that um, when we think about coding and, and categorizing these murders that we find in newspapers. So I'm kind of reluctant in certain ways to give the number where we are now, in part because this is still a project in process. This film was made about four years ago. Uh, one of the reasons why we're hesitant is we're out there now trying to meet, still gather cases. We have students right now out in the field. Um, as Professor Burnham said, people are dying. Uh, so we try to get there quickly. In one or two cases, we've actually had our students call and we think in one case actually call a perpetrator. Um, he was responsible for a death in Mobile, Alabama. And we, uh, 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 she called the home of someone who she suspected may have been the perpetrator. Um, he had never been arrested. And she started asking him about the murderer. And he said, who are you? Who are you? And his wife said, get off the phone. <laughs> so anyway, he got off the phone. We, we gave that case to the FBI. The, uh, Professor Burnham, although she's a practicing attorney, is not taking on these cases to uh, prosecute them. We hand them to the local to the authorities, in this case, the FBI. Since our job is mostly investigative and scholarly, and truth be told, that's pretty rare at this point. The cases that we're looking at in the 30s and the 40s, many people are, are, dying, are dying off, so we don't quite have that. That was pretty unusual, I must say. But... I think at this moment, we are comfortable in saying between 1930 and 1954, we can substantiate about 400 deaths. Um, we haven't yet coded to figure out which, we haven't organized them, um, we haven't tabulated them yet according to which states and such, and, and in a way that I can convey that information to you. But that is the end goal at the end of the day, to provide something which we think will allow scholars to, to delve even deeper, but as importantly, when we go out and talk about our, our project, I oftentimes go to family reunions to talk to families and such. Uh, they're interested in the stories, of course. They're interested in the big picture. But as one of the cases as, as talked about in the film with the Wright family, they had not, the mother had not told the children um, all that had happened to their father. I mean, they had some idea because they'd been there, but they left and 
they hadn't really talked about it in a way. And what we found in a lot of these cases is that when we come forward with the, to and talk to the families and bring them all this evidence, they are obviously very thankful. Um, uh, more and, and, and don't expect any kind of justice legal wise, but certainly are appreciative of the public acknowledgement. And that's a big part of this, which is telling stories that are untold. And at the end of the day, our goal is to have a fuller and richer picture of American history, not one that is uh, uh, glorified, not one that is necessarily, this isn't meant to be negative in a way, it's just to tell the truth. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, looking at the scholarship that's been done on Latin America and other countries, thinking about the ways in which authoritarianism can exist within democratic states. So there's a, 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 a scholarly aspect to it, and then there's also the human aspect, and then finally there is the legal aspect. The law matters in these cases, and although the law was not followed in certain parts of the country for too many years, um, it was a source of strength for us for now when we think about investigating. And even at the time, um, sometimes there were least trials, if not convictions. And it's an example of the ways in which institutions, they can be institutional failure, but then at the same time, um, years later, they can be a, 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 strengthening, a, a strengthening of institutions and they are being marshaled to bring justice uh, long denied. So with that, I'll end um, in the interest of having uh, a conversation, and um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Am I going to take questions? or? OK. Yes. Yeah, but the mic is coming. Thank you very much for your research and also for the talk. It was wonderful. Um, I'm very curious if, if your students, when they go out to meet these families, if any of the families have just shut down and told them they didn't want to talk to them about it. Because you showed some great examples, but I wonder if there's the opposite. Yes, we have had some families that have been less interested in it. Um, so. When, in those instances, it doesn't stop us from investigating the case. It does stop us, though, from in involving them in any kind of restorative justice and such. So, for example, these families were very interested, at least one of them, the last family, was interested in the, the community acknowledging it and, and coming to grips. It hasn't always been the case. You know, these deaths were oftentimes quite um, traumatic for many families in many ways. Uh, they either, many left the South, um, some um, left property behind. Those cases that are featured here don't show that, but some left property behind that they were unable to, uh, to pass on to their children. So you have intergenerational um, impoverishment, right? So ordinarily, if you can pass pr uh, property on, a family can do better. In many cases, that did not happen. In certain cases, in fact, um, people run out of town uh, uh, more successful African-American men were either killed or run out of town, and their property was taken over by the sheriffs and such. There are sometimes uh, material, clear material benefits that are behind these murders, which is not unlike what happened um, in Eastern Europe, um, Russia, looking at uh, Germany, um, uh, Jewish populations with the pogroms. It was the exact same thing, kind of basically wealth transfer through violence. So in that, in that regard, the U.S. is quite similar to many other instances around the world where you have targeting of groups and, uh, and taking of, of money. So yes, uh, of, of wealth and, and of possession property and such. So we, we, we do face that, um, we do, and we deal with it quite delicately because at the end of the day, since the students are learning about lawyering, part of being a good lawyer is listening to your client. And so the students learn that if a client is not interested in that way, then we move on to cases that, um, where the client is more receptive, but we continue the basic research because we need that for the database. Okay, I saw a hand up there, then there. You, sir? Yes. Oh, there are two, two men. Okay, whoever, go ahead. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. So thank you so much for your research. It's definitely much needed in painting a clear picture of what has happened uh, in the history of the U.S. Um, 
<clears throat> but from your perspective, um, with the research that you all are gathering and uh, with the new findings that you have for the next wave of scholars and activists, from your perspective, now what? What do we do with the information that you all are gathering now that we have it tangibly in our hands? What would be your, your admonition to the next wave of scholars and activists to do with it? So for activists today, I suspect they're concerned about today. And they may not be as interested in this. This is meant to be a corrective or to let people know that uh, uh, the history of violence that we see in the US today has long, has long roots. And in certain ways, this is a, a total historical project in a certain way, right? It's about un better understanding the Jim Crow period and the nature of coercion during Jim Crow. And, that, and it has a certain seal to it. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, there, is, there seems to be an, a family resemblance with murders that are happening today between police officers and uh, in certain black communities in particular. And um, I'm sympathetic to that, but I do think I kind of need to hold them in, in, at bay, that easy um, comparison. Uh, but it's certainly true that um, what, what complicates today in a way that was clearer in, during the Jim Crow period <coughs> is that back then the police kind of knew that they were doing the wrong thing. Um, they saw themselves in certain ways the police were uh, enforcers of Jim Crow mores. So I didn't mention any of these cases in the film, but there are cases, um, one comes to mind, but there are more than one, of, 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 um, of black men in particular getting murdered um, by policemen because the policemen didn't like the way they said they didn't take off their hat. They were insufficiently deferential. So the level of the trigger, the, the, what it took, the threshold for murder in certain small southern towns was quite low. Um, and it was entirely at the discretion of the sheriff. Another part that we found out about that, um, and I must say I, I was shocked by this, um, so we all know, many of us have heard, um, rather, um, in 1954, um, uh, 53, with, this, with the Montgomery bo bus boycott with uh, uh, Rosa Parks, she said, I'm not going to stand up to the bus. And that was the beginnings of the, uh, uh, the boycott. But in certain southern cities, principally Atlanta uh, and um, Birmingham, um, police uh, um, bus drivers were armed. So bus drivers were, in effect, policemen and bus drivers. So if you got into a fight with a bus driver, which was not uncommon, because after World War II, during World War II and after World War II, as many men came home from the army and they had their uniforms on, they would get on the bus, and they took offense at having to go in the back. So they would walk through the middle, and that would, because the idea was that black, men was, black people were supposed to get, pay your fare, then get off the bus and walk into the back. You couldn't walk through the center because you would pass white people. This is the nature of the mores, the customs in many southern cities. Men, were, they were tired of that. They just fought in World War II, so they wanted to walk down the aisle. That would occasion an argument with the bus driver. Now, ordinarily, a bus, an argument with the bus driver is an argument with the bus driver, except that the bus driver has a gun. And that was the case in Atlanta and Birmingham. So if you stood up to a bus driver, you were literally taking your life into your own hands. So you had laws which effectively deputized bus drivers as policemen. We don't live in that today. Today, we have policemen who are engaging in arguably um, excessive force against citizens. The issue usually is threat, do they, threat perception. So the issue for us today is to better understand what constitutes violence today and not conflate it with what happened during the Civil Rights Movement, but understand that in both instances, it is not a, um, we have some work to do between figuring out the relationship between citizen and state, and that all citizens don't have the same relationship with the state. And that is the, uh, you know, I would argue, the essential American dilemma. We have not sorted that out yet. We value citizenship but not everyone gets to experience the citizenship fully. Okay. Okay. I'm confused. <laughs> I'm not good at this. Martin, I'm going to have you do it because I'm. <laughs> okay, good, because you know who the folks are too. <laughs> 
Okay, hi. hi. I have about 50 questions, but I, I'll just do... You only get one. No, I only get, I only get one <laughs> in. Uh, I just First, I want to say thank you so much. It was really an amazing uh, talk. Um, I was amazed. Uh, the, the comment I have is that the conflict of Du Bois in Washington continues into the 1930s and 1940s mm -hmm. in terms of the NAACP and Tuskegee, mm -hmm. and that's really fascinating to think about. I, my two questions. Uh, number one is how many students have participated in this? Uh, uh, and the second question is how do they? How do you fund the travel for them, for going south? And then the other comment is, and I want you to just tell us about the the newspapers that they they're using. Sure. What those papers are. Sure. Okay, I don't have a good idea of the student, number of students I suspect now, because this is at the law school I'm at MIT, so I, I don't follow it quite as closely. Um, but each clinic has about 12 students, and there have been clinics for the past uh, about nine years. Um, and the clinics go on a quarter system, um, uh, but not every quarter is the clinic isn't offered. So uh, the great thing about this, at least prior, uh, the students do very well job-wise, which is one of the reasons why the students love it, right? I mean, some students come in and they're into it. They want to do this kind of work. Others aren't into it, but they get into it, um, in part because they actually feel um, uh, that their research matters, and it does, right? Because it's, it, you know, we, we really rely on the students, and many of them develop very close relationships with the families and such. Okay, that was your first question. Second question was? Oh, how do we pay for it? Um, in, uh, so at the beginning of this case, at the beginning of the clinic, Professor Burnham won a, a big case um, in Alabama, a, um, um, a 1964 murder case of the Klan, and uh, she represented, and won from this, uh, a county in Alabama, a substantial amount of money, and she plowed it back into the clinic. And um, we've gotten some private donor support, and there's in-kind support from Northeastern. So Northeastern gives support. We do some fundraising. Um, we've got some um, big grants in now for the Ford Foundation, which we hope will support us, and um, in that. Um, newspapers. So newspapers is, pretty, is really interesting. In certain ways, this project probably couldn't have happened before digitization of newspapers. Um, so ProQuest, you can look up historical black newspapers. Uh, these are the national weekly newspapers. They're not dailies, they're weeklies. But there are enough of them where you can get a good idea. So we basically, you put in a ton of search terms consistently, lynching, mob, violence, posse, and, uh, and uh, Negro, you know, and things come up. Um, so those are the newspapers that are used on the first cut. But once the students go down into the field, and not all cases are we able to send students down into the field. Um, but when we go down into the field, um, we immediately look at the local archives and local records, and um, that's where digita digitization has not happened. And so we're still relying upon basic investigative and archival skills that students have to have. Um, they become basically baby journalists in addition to baby litigators because a big part of being a lawyer is discovery and baby lawyers. I mean, they're learning all of these skills, um, but they get a different reception, and, I, and they get two receptions in two di different dimensions. They get different receptions from students who are not law students, so graduate students in history, because people pay attention if you say you're a law student. If you can't come down and you say you're a historian, they're like, oh, whatever. They blow you off or, you know, see you later. Um, if you come in and say that you're a legal, a law student, oh, law, suit, problems, they start, they, you know, they get, they, they pay attention. But sometimes they are less cooperative as a result because they know there's something at stake in, with the law, and the law student might actually know something, which they may or may not, but, you know, that's our secret. <laughs> the second part of it, though, is um, the differences between black and white, or black and non-black. So, in general, we find that, and this won't surprise anyone, um, black students don't do too well when they have to go up against white uh, 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 county clerks and such, they get immediately suspicious time the students come into the door. So what we typically do is, if we can, pair the students in interracial groups and let the white student go in. Just so that they will give them, a, because people are still suspicious. On the flip side, black students do better with black victims. Right? The families are typically more willing to open up, invite us into their homes, and begin to talk to us. And some, but talk, talking to us doesn't necessarily mean cooperate. I've had several meetings. Professor Burnham and I usually do a trip ourselves in the summer. Two summers ago, we went down to a way in the middle of nowhere, Mississippi. 
and um, met with a man, and, and he told us his whole story, and, and, but he was very reluctant. I mean, it took us about two or three visits to come to see him, and he said, because all these people still live here. They live there, they can live here. And when you all leave, we're here. And that fear and of lack of, and, and kind of sense of place and um, is not unique to the American South or any, that's true of all, you know, all human societies, right? There are, there are d d sometimes it's difficult to deal with things that are very close to home. Um, and, and, uh, and while we think about the U.S. as a highly mobile society, in certain ways that's true, but in certain ways, there's certain parts of the country, all over the country, where people live for generations. And so it's very difficult to deal with these kinds of things when you have that. And on the one hand, uh, it, for obvious reasons, right, people aren't willing to, to, to face it. Thank you very much. It was really interesting and uh, clarificatory. Um, you said there were four aspects to your definition. Yes. Uh, uh, and a death as a result of an illegal act carried yes. out by more than three people. Yes. And then could you possibly revisit element four, where yes. you said it was for the purposes of political or justice? No, for, th under the pretext there of you go. service, justice, um, justice, tradition, or, or race. Okay, so I thought that was really interesting. I'd be really interested if you could unpack that and how you arrived at that definition and what purpose that serves. Sure. Well, in certain ways, that was a definition that the NAACP and Tuskegee came to, in part because in the justifications for these kind of extra legal killings, there was often either a notion of service, service to the community, right? That meaning um, there are these people out there and they are a danger to us or they are... Um, they are uh, uh, violating Jim Crow norms um, uh, of undue deference. So there, the, there was the law of segregation, right? So blacks and whites live separately and stuff. And then there was the behavior of segregation, which meant that you had to observe it in your, in your comportment, how you behaved. And if you were unduly deferential, that could be uh, deadly offense. So service, keeping things, you know, service to Jim Crow, service to uh, our social uh, hierarchy. Justice, well, ju I mean, tradition, service to justice was um, uh, just that, right? That this, this racial order was just, right? I mean, that was part of the thinking. I mean, it was reflected a natural hierarchy. It was rooted in slavery. And you know, yeah, we had this thing called the end of slavery in the, in the Civil War, but we can rectify that through Jim Crow. We'll just kind of re-inscribe re it. Similarly, with tradition, this is Southern tradition, our way of life. Part of the arguments against uh, the beginnings of the civil rights movements when you had uh, Northerners coming from the North down to the South, particularly to Mississippi in 1964, for example, right? The idea is that don't come down here and mess with our tradition. This is the Southern way of life. You Northerners don't like it, you don't have to live here. And then race, which was kind of compounded. So those three things together, so it's the way of the NAACP and Tuskegee recognizing that the basis for the murders would not be, for example, basic criminality, right? There were black, white, and white criminals. There was bootlegging. There was all kinds of things that was happening. They weren't interested in those. Those were just your standard murders, but Oftentimes, the pretext for these kinds of murders had a higher order to it, and it had something to do with the preservation of the cultural dimensions of white domination in the South, and it had to do with justice and service and, um, and dedication to race, to the preservation of white supremacy. That was basically what that was for. Hi, I'm up here. <laughs> Thank you again for your talk. It was amazing. Um, I have kind of a more general question sure. and your opinion on, I was interested in the film, um, some of the relatives of these white perpetrators yes. still are not confronting um, what their relatives and ancestors are doing, and in some cases, even them, and how you see racial tensions changing in the future or worsening because of these white Southerners and whites in general not being able to confront um, their past. Yeah, that's a, thank you for that. I mean, that's something that we've actually talked about in the clinic and I think recognize we haven't done as good a job with, which is going to the other side of the story. Sometimes there are actually, uh, well, first we're in, in, 
in certain of our cases, we have met perpetrator families or someone connected to them um, who kind of give us a bit of a hint that they knew what was happening. But there's a lot of shame and embarrassment. I mean, it's just not something that easily is dealt with. There's one thing to say, uh, this segregation and violence was a part of Southern history, but then we had the Civil Rights Movement and now we're better. It's, in a general way, it's another thing to say, my uncle, my grandfather, my, was involved with it. Those are two separate things and we have, with some exceptions, been unable to get to that in part because we don't have the students, that we have to send students out there to do that, white students basically, to gain the confidence of the perpetrator. So in certain ways, our methodology, methodology doesn't well reflect, reflects but imperfectly reflects um, the very thing we're trying to over, you know, better understand. Right? And in certain ways, we have to send out segregated teams to better understand segregation. Um, and um, to the degree that we haven't been able to do that, we, I think we have um, not been able to get the full stories. But what this means, to answer your question about what it means today, is that Americans have a lot of soul searching to do. We just do. We just do. It's, you know, it's difficult. It's all of these things. Um, but um, we still haven't dealt with it. And what makes this period difficult as opposed to slavery or even right after slavery is that people are still alive. If not, you know, so this is not my generation, then the generation before me, my parents and the generation, the people are still living. So this is living history. This isn't some ancient history, which I think makes it very difficult for people to deal with. But I, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's in our social life, even if we don't fully admit it, but we've got a long way to go on that. Uh, question, yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, <clears throat> most of the victims of lynching were blacks, there's no doubt about it, but it's interesting that you mentioned in the beginning of your talk that about 10, 15 percent of the lyn lynching victims were whites, mm. especially in the West, Arizona, Utah, etc. Could you draw the parallels between the cases like the southern lynching and no southern lynching when the victims were blacks and non-blacks. Right, so that's something we haven't yet done. I'm, and I, I don't wanna misrepresent this here. Lynching and extra legal violence was something that went on throughout many parts of the country. In the West, many Mexicans, Latinos, Chinese, blacks in the North, it's all over. Well, it, Rio Frank in Atlanta. Yes, right. in, 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 but we've, in the South it was, so I don't wanna suggest that the lynching itself was just a southern, a, a racial phenomenon in the South, but rather the argument is more better understanding the nature of Jim Crow in the South and, and violence, is, violence is part of it, violence's role in it. So I don't, I don't want to, to misrepresent that in any regard. We haven't yet looked outside the region in part because we're not necessarily, although we're talking about violence, we're more interested in what violence, how violence was a part of Jim Crow. Um, so it's a slightly different question than just looking at lynching all across the country. Um, but there is no question that, uh, that lynching was, um, was a, a big part of American justice outside, it was known as you know, euphemistically as rough justice outside of the South. Um, so I appreciate your question, but we haven't yet drawn those parallels. Oh, I actually just have one last question that he just posed. Oh, just okay. Right. So there are other, um, there are some scholars, and not quite doing it in quite the way that we're doing it. Um, but they are, there's a, a resurgent interest in extra legal violence throughout the states in the periods, in the 20th century, <laughs> um, mid to early 20th century. Uh, and I don't know, though, if there's this legal dimension in, in the way that we're looking at it. Um, in that regard, it may be quite unique to Northeastern Law School. One thing that we're trying to do, and Professor Burnham has written some articles about pedagogy, how to teach this, because we would like actually people to do it. Right? Um, in fact, we would like people to, in their local, throughout local counties, there are tons of community colleges, tons of students who need master's thesis. We're like, you could take a county and study it, you know, um, because it would go a long way. And in part, that's partly, I, I say that not quite facetiously, you know, a part of 
of intellectual work or scholarly work is resources, obviously. Um, and you know, certain parts of the country haven't always put any investments in it either at any level, right? I mean, the South in certain ways is notorious for that. In part, it was a, a region that um, uh, was with this basis in agriculture wasn't nearly as developed or developed later than other parts of the country, but never had the investment in in uh, in uh, in uh, certain scholars, scholarship about this period, precisely because they're not interested in studying this period for obvious reasons. So it's taken people from outside um, to do it. So it is, you know, there are scholars who are doing it, but I think we're pretty unique in on the legal dimensions of it. Hi. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the talk and all of the really important research you're doing. Um, I was just wondering, you use the term authorita authoritarian regime to define the South. Do you yes. think that term is applicable today in regards to the relationship between the justice system and the African-American community? No, I don't. Um, uh, it's Certainly the justice system could do better. There's no question about that. Um, but the authoritarianism, I use that word, and there's some, it's some contention. I mean, this is something that comparativists and Americanists people say American politics and comparative politics kind of argue over, Americanists tend not to like that descriptor, in part because they say, well, it's not really authoritarian. I mean, whites could vote, right? So it's more of a racial authoritarianism. There's only one certain dimensions of the country, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of these states. Certain segments of the populations could not vote. Um, so they would probably argue it was a, a, re a severely restricted, racially restricted democracy. But but for me, that's you know that's that's um, not quite as illuminating. In part because it takes the point of view uh, not of black citizens who were effectively living under authoritarianism. They couldn't vote, um, and uh, and nor did the uh, the elected officials feel accountable to them. Um, and so, consequently, uh, that combined with this coercion made it a different experience. So I wouldn't describe what we live in today as authoritarian, but um, we have. You know, I mean, you know, there's lawyers that are working. Police departments are being sued. There are, uh, there are, the mechanisms may work slowly, but what is a problem is, uh, and this was something that the pr past president, President Obama, tried to deal with, but those uh, efforts have now been stopped, which is getting police departments to be involved with consent decrees and actually looking at policing practices. Right? What's going on in these encounters such that they do not end up being deadly? Right? so that they can be the administration of law without death and for relatively minor infractions, or if there was infraction at all. Um, and that's something that boils down to practices getting into the weeds. And under his administration, and I'm not an Obama booster, this is just what the Justice Department was doing, they, um, they uh, set up consent decrees with certain police departments recognizing that they needed reforms. Uh, New Orleans, uh, uh, Chicago, Newark, I mean, there's several, uh, uh, um, and those have, could have continued under the current administration, but um, they have not given the money for that. But certain of these police departments continue to be involved with these consent decrees, even if now the Department of Justice says, you don't have to have these consent decrees. But they see the value of it for increasing community policing and making it more fair and efficacious. So. No, I don't think so. I mean, it may be a, um, it's provocative as a thought, but it's not, I don't think well describes the period that we're in now. But we are in a very perilous period, that said. Thank, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I just have a question going back to this, the 30s and the- Sure. The, the period of the murders you, and the lynchings you talked about. To what extent did the Ku Klux Klan have a role in 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 some or all or, or a few of these? I mean, in terms of actually perpetrating, and, and if not perpetrating, then at least protecting, you know, the, the the perpetrators because they might have been members of the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, the Ku Klan, I'm asking about the Ku Klux Klan, and I, I suppose other analogous organizations that it might have been more local and. Right. So the Klan was certainly a part of this. But I must say that what our research has more often shown is the absence of the Klan. It's not the Klan. This is ordinary citizens. So what's made it um, challenging is this, the certain 
in certain of these things, this kind of capricious nature of it. Some of them are quite, for example, you get into an argument with the bus driver, you're dead. Something happens, you run into someone, he doesn't like the way you looked at him, someone falsely accuses you, a lynch mob is, gathers. What made it difficult was precisely because it didn't appear to have the organization, the predictability that the Klan would give. I mean, the Klan, you knew there were certain things you could not could not do. They would often have calling signs. They bird across on your lawn. You know, they kind of let you know when they were coming, right? But um, the other, other instances of violence were not that at all. So that's what actually, I mean, if, for me, what has been probably the most surprising is when we look at the cases, the actual circumstances of them, was there seemingly, um, not, not, capricious is the way to describe it, and that it effectively made every uh, white citizen an enforcer of Jim Crow, because you would never, you were never convicted. So you knew that you, would, you could operate in impunity, and all you basically had to say was that person did X, Y, and Z. So I'll give an example. And luckily, no one from my family was ever murdered. But my father served in the Army in, in between the war. And he had his uniform on. And he and a friend were going to Alabama to sign up to go to, to base. And they decided they were going to stop in a restaurant. And they get to the restaurant. And the guy says, you all have to go in the back and eat out in the back because you can't eat in the front. So my father and his friend go and sit in the dining room. And they're served. So this is during the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, early 50s, like 51. So. They're served. And my father's really surprised by that. And so he always talks about it because he said, we weren't lynched that day. The expectation, it didn't happen, but it could have. And so, you know, he... He's an 80-something-year-old man. He only told me this now that he's an adult. He never told me this when I was a child. All that he experienced because he didn't want me and my brother to deal with that. He said, you all have a new day. That's what we had the civil rights movement for. But as an adult, I begin to hear these stories. So I only raise that to say this, the capriciousness of it, the kind of day-to-day -day things you had to make calculations about. And you, you know, many times, Certain parts, uh, that said, he was from Tennessee. Tennessee was not Mississippi, was not Georgia, was not Alabama, was not Texas, was not Florida. Those parts of the country, it was no joke. Uh, thank you for your, your talk. Um, my question is more general uh, sure. around maybe your, your work sure. internationally and the, the, the other countries you deal with. It's the whole value of preserving history and a lot of people's histories are kept secret. Have you had any experience dealing with maybe um, in countries or areas where the, the history is very oral and therefore things are being lost and maybe like starting some kind of project that could bring things to light that could make this history known? Right, now, that's a great question. I myself have not been involved with it, but I, I will say that in, in that regard, but I will say that you're absolutely right. Oral histories are crucially important. And now that we've got um, uh, a technology through iPhones, through different ways that people can begin to record these histories, but it has to be a deliberate effort. Now, I'm not going to say without cases, it's true with any kind of oral histories, one has to cooperate, right? People's memories are failing and this and that. So while we present it in that way, we don't always, we, Oftentimes, the cases have to go up against what we find to be the documentary facts and kind of weigh the two. I don't, you know, sometimes uh, papers themselves, gov government documents aren't always the most accurate because, as we saw, for example, the medical examiner writes things that they know um, would, uh, would, uh, um, you know, would ar you know, arguably were flaw false or at least contradicted eyewitness testimony. So there is always the challenge between weighing documentary evidence, how it's gathered, oral histories and such. But to the degree that oral histories are, history is passed down through oral methods, it seems to me that there has to be a lot more concerted effort on um, uh, using the technologies that we have today to actually um, preserve it and not leave it not leave it to chance, I, I, you know. Um, this tape and these tapes that we've done for this, we, we collect oral histories, by the way, for these cases. We, 
we, uh, we record folks. Um, um, and we have to be careful how we do that um, because people sometimes will tell us, but we're not sure they necessarily want us to make it public. Because although these are incredibly interesting cases for a scholar, for these families, it's their family members. And they're not interested in necessarily having their stories told. We had to obviously get the permission from these families to do this. So there are lots of complications. That's what would be true with anything. Um, I think it's important. I haven't directly done it, but I certainly support those efforts. All right, thank you.